Hey everyone, welcome to the Cannabis Technology. And with me today, I'm pretty excited to speak with uh, the CEO of Botana, Robert Schneider. How are you doing today, Robert? I am doing well. It's a beautiful sunny day in Southern California, so it's hard to hard to be upset about. Fantastic. That. I was just going to say, have the fires gone away? I know that was a big deal for a while. Uh, yeah, they. Uh, Fortunately, a while ago they did, but it was really a, a tragedy. Uh, I had a lot of friends, uh, both up north but also here in SoCal, that uh, were heavily affected by the fires. A lot of farms were destroyed, and um, not just uh, crops, but buildings and houses and homes. Uh, yeah. It was really uh, quite a tragedy, for sure. Yeah, yeah, big deal. I have some friends down there as well. Um, so fantastic. Well, thank you for making this. I know you're a really uh, busy guy with all that you've got going on with Botana. Um, can I start with just a very basic question? Is, is Botana considered uh, an operating system, um, an app, all the above? How would you, what's, what's the 20-second elevator pitch on Botana? I love the term operating system. Um, it encompasses a lot of things. Um, uh, that definitely, uh, you know, down the road, I would imagine. At this point, we are app-based, and the primary reason for that is that growers are in the field. Uh, they don't have the ability a lot of times to sit at a computer to perform data entry or analytics. They need uh, access to their information while they're running around a garden, uh, out in a field, et cetera. Um, right. But we, uh, ultimately, Botana is a platform uh, that's designed to optimize uh, a grower's operation, whether it be one location, multiple locations. Um, and to you know, pull data in from all sources, and to provide insight back to the grower. Okay. So can we talk about the, the types of tools you can provide growers to, to help optimize, you know, some of the things they're doing in their guards? Yeah, there's a lot of tools that we can provide. Um, and, and what's exciting to me about this particular niche of the market is that Growers have been neglected by uh, Silicon Valley for many years, uh, partly because they didn't want to be exposed and to put their data into any sort of system. Uh, but also, Silicon Valley has sort of ignored the uh, agriculture and farming until uh, really the, the most recent years here. Um, and so there's this glut of, uh, uh, or this lack of technology uh, throughout the industry. And growers are just starting to understand, uh, you know, how they can use technology to optimize their gardens. Um, the, the primary things are automation that everybody sees, you know, things like uh, controlling your environment or your lighting uh, through automated tools. Uh, but, but really, automation is kind of the highest level. Uh, growers use a lot of different technologies throughout their workday uh, constantly. Uh, in fact, you know, if you think about uh, a pair of shears, uh, clippers that a grower uses to prune back a plant, that's actually technology. And uh, a lot of times, I think we focus on the high-tech stuff and the whiz-bangy, you know, full automated growth systems and things like that. And the reality is that, right. that the grower working in their garden use a, a litany of tools um, uh, to, to do various things, everything from how they mix their reservoir and, and making sure that it's properly aerated uh, all the way up to some sort of automation. Um, so Botana's primary goal is to allow the grower to leverage all of those tools and to track and, uh, and analyze the effect of all of these inputs, whether it be the method of pruning or the type of fertilizer or the environmental variables, and understand really how to grow each strain uh, the best way, and even that strain within a specific growing environment, how we can optimize that strain for the best results. Okay. Let's profile, um, if we could, the grower. And then, in other words, how many growers are, are using the app? Are they, are they primarily um, professional growers? Um, is there a level of experience there it's best optimized for? Let's talk a little bit about the folks using this thing and, and who you're targeting. Yeah, it's a little difficult because growers have such a diverse uh, profile. Uh, you sure. find a hobby grower. Uh, it's got a, maybe a light in his basement or a couple plants out in the backyard all the way up to these large-scale commercial growers with hundreds of thousands of square feet, uh, and then the workers that are within that grow. Um, I generally, we're, Botana is, is uh, a tool for professional growers, and I define that as 
any grower that is making money by growing, um, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be a small-scale uh, medical grower in a medical uh, state where they are growing, you know, a small amount of product for a few patients, uh, all the way up to a commercial grower that is, uh, uh, you know, operating maybe in a licensed structure, multiple locations, and um, many workers working on their on their garden. Uh, in these initial stages, uh, I think we gear towards uh, our profiles a little bit more on the small to medium sized grower. Um, but some of the tools that we're bringing out in 2018 is going to open up access to uh, these larger scale operations for sure. Okay. Um, and we have about uh, we have about se yeah we have about 7,000 growers currently using the platform. Uh, I think we're recording this here beginning of February. Um, we're about yeah just over 7,000. No kidding. So, Robert, I understand uh, from our last conversation um, that one of the biggest challenges in the industry right now are uh, varying reports, typically from 75, 90 percent of samples being tested at labs are, are contaminated with some sort of pesticide or fungus residue, which astounds me. And so one of the, the, the things that's so interesting about this is the bug tracker. Um, how is bug tracking address, uh, the, the bug tracker addressing this issue? It is a real challenge. Um, I, I think it's always been an issue for growers, but we've just never had this oversight and visibility um, and, and requirements for testing. And so now it's, it's not that this is a new problem, it's that it's now coming to light. And in solving this problem, uh, which is it's universal, it doesn't matter where you go, there's, there's these issues. Uh, the biggest, uh, the first step is to first understand the problem. Uh, what are the kind of bugs that are and, and pests and disease that are applying pressure to our crops? Uh, how impactful is that pressure? Uh, and what are the tools that are most effective? And it's 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 a bit difficult because every situation, you know, if if a, if a grower walks into the garden and sees a spider mite, that's a very specific situation. He might, you know, he or she might be at a different stage in growth, maybe veg or flower, or further into flower and and maybe a young plant. Um, they might be growing in some sort of an organic environment, or they might be in a state where certain pesticides are restricted. There's all these nuances to how the grower can make a decision to combat this problem. And I, I think that the individual grower has maybe a good idea of how to solve problems in their garden. But as a community, as, as an industry, I don't think that we've developed really strong uh, IPM protocols, um, whereas if you go to, you know, the grape industry or, or um, blueberries or such, uh, they have a lot more established protocols because they've been doing it for a lot longer in this formal manner. Um, so this sort of mm -hmm. discovery phase is, is kind of where we're at, and I think that the, uh, the most important thing is, is learning first, and that's what Bug, tra bug Tracker is geared towards uh, now is helping the grower understand what is the impact uh, on quality and yield. Of, of this pest and disease, uh, what are the tools that are most effective? Uh, when am I seeing these trends in onset of pest and disease pressure? What are the vectors uh, as they apply to the garden and, and, and how bad they spread through the garden? Uh, that's kind of the first, the first stage. Uh, secondly, uh, through gathering this data and then running it through our analytics engine, uh, especially because we are tying the, the integrated pest management protocols in with the fertilizer and environmental and even the, the visual observational uh, data that the grower is collecting, uh, this data is going to help the individual grower and us as a community to start to understand what's causing these, what are the, what are the uh, sources of these pest and disease pressure? Uh, is it a fertilizer regimen that's, that's maybe making the plant a little less vigorous? Uh, is it environmental variables that are encouraging the growth of, of certain spores? Um, we need to put all this data into one place. We can't isolate it and treat it individually. We have to understand it all together. Um, and, and I think mm -hmm. the long-term impact um, that I hope to see through this um, is uh, not just a decrease in uh, the use of pesticides and, and fungicides and whatnot, uh, but really the maturity of our understanding of, of the full integrated pest management uh, process. I went to um, a blueberry farmer up in uh, the Northwest uh, a couple years ago. And when they showed me their, their spray protocol, uh, they were spraying two, three chemicals a week on their blueberries. 
And you know, these are all supposedly safe chemicals. They're approved by the EPA and all that stuff. Um, but when I looked at this protocol, I was shocked at the number of products and chemicals that they're applying to this fruit that we eat. And I asked the farmer, why do they spray all this? Do they have this big of a problem with, with fungus and pests? And the farmer's response was, well, not really, but you know, it's, it's not worth the risk to not spray this stuff on there. And that's unfortunate well, to me because that's a, that's a point of ignorance. They're, they're acting out of fear. They're putting all these chemicals on that may or may not be necessary, and yet somehow they're probably ending up in our food supply. Uh, whether you wash it off you know, before you eat it or not, this stuff is still being sprayed. It's going into our groundwater. It's in the air. It's affecting the workers in the field, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and I hope that through this intelligence of data uh, you know, and, and combining all these different aspects of data together, not just the bug information or the IPM information, but combining with the, the protocols and the actions that the grower is taking, that we can really start to solve these problems and eliminate the need for that fear to be there in the first place so we can make more intelligent uh, and strategic decisions on what our applications are for IPM. That's so interesting. And Robert, I've, I've actually experienced that in another field, somewhat similar. There's a parallel here, and it's with um, with um, uh, the meats and um, mm. you know, ranchers going out and, and uh, inoculating mass herds of cattle. Um, they're just shotgunning antibiotics, and this stuff is showing up in the yeah. food supply now. And uh, so, yeah, yeah the remedies really are huge. <laughs> yeah. you know, there's some interesting so technology. It's interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, there's some interesting technology um, that's starting to be employed. It's, I still question how accurate it is and how uh, really truly effective or if it's kind of gimmicky, but a lot of these uh, satellite imagery and some of this uh, machine or the computer vision tools that are being used to identify uh, sick plants or, or you know, fungally infected plants or, or deficient plants. And instead of spraying an entire field uh, with a pesticide or an herbicide, let's say, they have these tractors now that are driving over fields and using computer vision or identifying what the weeds are and just spraying the weeds with the, a little bit of herbicide to kill that weed without actually spraying the, the crop itself. And uh, they're cutting down their usage of fungicide tremendously, but also, you know, it's, 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 it's being smarter. It's saying we don't need to cover the entire field. If, if there's a vector, you know, in the, in the northwest corner of a field, maybe we only treat that area you know, we don't need to apply pesticide to the entire crop uh, because it's not necessary. Yeah, that seems to be the way of the future. It's going to be interesting. Um, so in terms of experience, Robert, I'm, I'm curious. I have a background in my previous life in, in product design, and uh, one of the challenges early on is always trying to decide is it best in, in building a product to build a web-based app versus a, a native app um, what drove you guys to uh, make that decision on building something native? Yeah, it was an early decision we made. Uh, I remember spending several uh, weeks discussing the nuances of the benefits um, because it's a lot more difficult when you do this. And it's not so much about the native or, or non-native web base. Uh, it's more about access for the growers. And we found that about maybe 35% or so of our growers are regularly lack uh, connectivity in their in their garden. Uh, they might be out in the field in a field in a valley somewhere. Uh, they might be in a grow room that's got, you know, insulation and multiple walls, uh, poor Wi-Fi signal and whatnot. And uh, because the grower is uh, in the field doing their work, uh, they often, they, you know, they need their data at that point of work, right? They don't often want to go back to right. a computer in an office with a nice Wi-Fi signal or a hard line to be able to, to enter all the data. They need to be able to take pictures and log data, but also to look back and say, what happened here last week? Why does it look like this? And they need that access to that really critical data uh, you know, all the time. And so we were very intentional about making sure that the access to that the most essential data is offline so they can uh, log, record, and reflect. Uh, and then, of course, you know, everybody goes back to their house or, or uh, somewhere else at the end of the day and uh, we built a pretty robust synchronization engine uh, to handle that back end to make sure that everything's backed up securely and privately and that there's also no data loss. Okay, which just kind of leads to my next question since the app does work offline. Can you kind of quickly walk us through, 
you know, how somebody might take photos, you know, of their strain in, in high def, and then it, is that that's stored in their device, and, and it's later sent to the cloud? Is that kind of phase two, or do you need to be near an internet connection for some things and not, not others? What, what's kind of the vision there? Yeah, um, it's, it's a pretty seamless experience, actually. The, the user never really knows what's happening, um, which is kind of great, because we don't want to get in their way, right? We want to be a supplement to their right. work, not, uh, not an addition or an interference. Um, so a lot of the, what we do is, is uh, done silently in the background. And uh, if there's a connection, then you know things will be backed up immediately. If not, things are stored locally and, and then synchronized up uh, when a connection comes available. Okay, that's kind of what I thought. And does it do you do you guys go about curating a strain database, which seems to be a, a metric that's kind of waffling in terms of. Um, <laughs> The, the value of strange strains and it's kind of agnostic to some folks um, but it's you know it's over nine thousand strains do, do you guys how do you guys approach that this is one of the biggest messes in the industry uh, yeah you know there's a problem first of all of uh, anybody renaming a strain whether it be the dispensary or the grower or the distributor just because they want to sell it and and that's definitely an issue that needs to be solved uh, you know down the road um, but when we when we look at what a you know strain is, I know there's a lot of conversation around uh, indica sativa. Are they even really things? And what is a strain? Uh, strains are real. You know, if you go to the strawberry industry, there are varieties of strawberries that have certain characteristics, and growers use different varieties sure. depending on the climate and the soil type and all that. So um, strains are something that's important, and it's really a uh, the way I look at it is, uh, you know, it's a a, a specific uh, genotype, uh, genetic profile of a, a plant that has certain characteristics that, you know, may grow in a certain environment or a certain method uh, a, a better than another environment. Um, but I think the really big confusion, what, the problem that I really am passionate about solving is we've kind of got these bookends of knowledge right now in, in the industry. And if you look at the, the genetic profile of a plant, and there's some companies that are working on sequencing the genome and understanding you know, which strains are actually what genes so we can identify and isolate and verify strains. Uh, that's what we call the genotype. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. uh, at the other end of the process, we've got uh, what some people call a chemovar or a chemotype. And this is the analysis uh, of that, uh, the output of that strain. And those, the laboratories are working on that, right? Terpene profiles, what are the ranges of terpene profiles that a certain strain could exhibit? Um, what levels sure. of THC might be expected from that, what flavor profiles, et cetera. Um, the, the challenge is, Rob, is that in the middle of that is this massively influential component called the phenotype. And the phenotype is, is sort of like what we call epigenetics when we refer to uh, our own genes, um, is all the inputs, every action that's taken on that plant, whether it be an environmental input or a nutritional input, uh, whether it's grown in... Colorado or down at sea level, all these different factors that play into the expression of the genotype. And that phenotype, yeah. as I see it, is what drives the result that becomes the chemotype. And, and I think where we have this massive scale of ignorance right now, um, just through lack of data and lack of, uh, of uh, corporate knowledge, is really understanding if I've got a genotype with these you know, expected characteristics, and I grow it in these certain ways, what's the output? In other words, what fertilizing event, what nutritional profile throughout the plant's life is going to truly give it certain higher levels or better balanced levels of different terpenes? And we haven't made that connection yet, I don't think, as a, as a, as a uh, community of growers. Uh, you know, I think individual growers have mm -hmm. a sense about what does things, but the data layer in that middle phenotype, it just it lacks. And so when we talk about the, what a strain is and an expression of this, I think where we're going to go is we will narrow the amount of strains that there are uh, over time as we realize that a lot of these 9,000 names might be kind of BS. Um, but also I think we're going to get more mature and we're going to start growing plants according to what our goals are and what our outcomes are, not just for fluff and, oh, this one's this color and blah, 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 and all the kind of the, the, uh, the hype that happens among uh, consumers. 
but growers uh, mm -hmm. that I talk to are, are really interested in let's make strains that are more powdery mildew resistant or that are more geared towards CBD and, and hemp strains and whatnot. And as, we, as the market matures and we have some consolidation of cultivating uh, experience, we're going to get much more reliable strains, first of all, that we can verify and know. And then through the data that Botana is gathering, uh, we're going to understand the, what the, the proper phenotype is for each strain so that we can more accurately predict uh, and, and drive the outcomes on that chemotype. Um, what's exciting, you said 9,000 strains. I think we're somewhere around that range. I haven't looked recently, but a lot of that was curated just through, you know, public data, uh, of course, and our own, our own research. Um, but we've had over now, I think about 1,000, uh, just over 1,000 strains that have been uniquely created by Botana growers, uh, most of okay. those being new cultivars. And, yeah, and it's really exciting to me to see this kind of genesis point where a grower is saying, I've created this new strain. Uh, I want to I record it somewhere. I want to sort of stick my, my stake in the ground and say, this is mine. And, uh, and mm -hmm. you know, through some of the tools that we're building that are going to be coming later in 2018, uh, there will be tools for uh, the verification and validation of strains, uh, both who is uh, who has uh, created it, is it real, you know, who who's kind of the owner of it, and is it an actual new cultivar, uh, but also then uh, where does that go from there? Who has the rights to grow it? Who has permissions? Um, so we can start bringing some sense of order to this really really big problem. Sure. This is a great segue into my next question regarding sensors. We, we've talked to a lot of folks about sensors, and that there's so many, so many smart devices coming out that are providing all these metrics, and, and um, there, there's different models for it. Can you, can you talk a little bit, without giving away the goods, uh, your plans to launch kind of an integrated platform, phase two or phase three, that gives us that accurate data, depending on whatever the grower is trying to do, um, and depending on whatever system they have in their garden. Yeah, I think this is going to be the biggest point of growth that we see in the industry as far as growers go, is the adoption of uh, higher resolution sensor arrays um, and leading mm -hmm. to better analytics and automation. Uh, if you look at the industry right now, though, by numbers, by my guess, I, I don't know if anybody really knows this, but just by my own research, uh, we're about less than 10% of growers are using some uh, high resolution sensors and or automation. Um, and if they are using automation, a lot of it's just, you know, environmental turning ACs on and off when it gets too hot and cold. Um, uh, fully automated grow rooms represent a very small percentage of the market. Um, but, you know, if we look fast forward for the next 10 years, every grower will have embraced all of these sensors and automation uh, in their operations to, to one degree or another. Um, it's Man. the technology adoption curve, uh, and it, but it's going to happen. And I think the, the biggest challenge for growers is you've got these really expensive, full-scale, robust systems uh, that exist. They're very expensive, and so they really only work for the large, large-scale growers with big investment. Um, and then you've got kind of the dumb automation where it's just flicking a switch on and off based upon maybe a couple, you know, variables like temperature. Um, Mm -hmm. There's this big mid-market. You know, a lot of growers are not massive scale. Most of the growers are still medium, uh, small to medium-sized growers. And uh, I'm, I'm, I've been looking for somebody to fill this gap. And I haven't really found any companies that have really done a great job yet of filling that middle market uh, need for high-resolution sensors that are affordable and easy to deploy. And, uh, you know, I think moving forward, I, you know, like I said earlier, Botana is a platform, so... It's our goal to connect to all these sensors, regardless of who makes them and, and how they are, because we're providing a layer of intelligence on top of that, uh, that data. But, uh, but frankly, I, I just think that the technology is still kind of behind the eight ball on, on these sensors, and the cost needs to come down mm -hmm. uh, in order for growers to really adopt them en masse. The benefit is astounding, though. When we can gather high-resolution data uh, across a lot of gardens, we can start to learn a lot more a lot quicker. And uh, we definitely need to go there, and I'm excited to see if some companies kind of pick that up and, and make something useful out of this. Sure. Very interesting. Now, Robert, I heard a rumor um, 
you can confirm or not, but I'm curious if you could touch on the fact, well, we've heard that you're developing a tool to track results of samples being tested in labs, which would be mm -hmm. a pretty incredible resource. Um, are you at liberty to provide us or touch on that at all? Um, well, I can't talk about specifics, um, but going back to what I, I said earlier about this, uh, this progression of, of genotype phenotype and chemotype. Uh, this is one of the most fascinating things to me uh, about growing is, is that connection between uh, what a grower does to a specific kind of plant and what that outcome is. And uh, the goal of, of, of this technology um, that we, we're working on it for sure, um, but the goal of this technology is that we can tie together those two bookended pieces of data that are fixed. You know, a chemotype, of the, you know, every strain is going to have a, a very uh, 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 expected range of all these different variables. You know, you're not going to get uh, uh, an orange to produce something that an orange is not ready to produce. Any, you know, uh, you're sure. not going to, you're going to get vitamin yeah. C in an orange, but you might not get vitamin C in, uh, in a master kush, let's say. So the genotype mm -hmm. determines what can be done and then the phenotype determines what ends up being done and the chemotype verifies that. And so by okay. integrating laboratory results with all of the cultivation data or the phenotypical data, um, we're going to learn some very interesting things about what are the correlations uh, between, again, these, these fertilizer events or certain uh, temperature profiles. Um, you know, when you uh, defoliate a plant, how long you flush, all of these different actions that we take, let's let's put this data together and we're going to really learn a lot about these strains and be able to maximize the health and the nutrition and the outcome uh, for the uh, end crop. Cool. So Robert, lastly, what are, what are some of the things we can look forward to seeing from Botana uh, in 2018? What's the future look like? 2018. It's hard to believe that we're already in February of 2018. Um, I think I'm still... You know what? I should correct disease. myself. I meant... Yeah, <laughs> I'm in 2017. Sorry, I'm I'm dating myself here. No, we're no, we're in 2018, right? Are we? Okay, it's something like that. I don't know. I'm still writing. You know how it is. The first few months. 2025. Year, writing, but, but, yeah, exactly. Give or take. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you. You know, uh, we have we have modeled our development process around how growers operate. Um, when you set up a garden that version of that garden is never the final version of the garden. You kind of set up what you can, and then every week a grower mm -hmm. comes in and iterates. Every day a grower comes in and iterates on that garden, tweaking and refining and changing and saying, let's add this, let's add that, let's take that away. As the, as the, the value starts to avail itself in a garden, uh, changes are made. And so we kind of take that same model in, in software development that's called agile development. And um, it basically means, you know, fast iterations. Um, we built a really good, sure. solid platform now, and uh, 2018 is really going to be about this fast iterations for us, um, getting feedback from growers in the field, what's working, what's not, what's valuable, what's not, and iterating really quickly uh, to provide uh, better and better tools. And uh, I, I think the, the big things I'm really looking forward to uh, that I can talk about is uh, our collaboration tool set, uh, where... Uh, you know, mm -hmm. right now the, the tool is kind of built for an individual grower working, whether they're working in a team or not, but built for the individual grower. Um, collaboration is going to connect growers, both inside an operation, uh, privately and securely, uh, but also outside an operation. When we talk about consultants um, or uh, educational uh, type of applications, allowing other people to uh, share data between one another uh, to get help and to get resources. Um, I think that's one of the most exciting things for me. Um, and secondly, we're going to be engaging a lot of, uh, a lot of some grower support um, organizations, uh, fertilizer companies, lighting companies, and providing a, a, a platform yeah. for them to better communicate with the growers and better educate. It's a real problem in the supply side uh, of these companies getting this education and, and um, uh, usage information to growers in a meaningful way. And uh, there's going to be some really interesting things that we're doing uh, later this year along those lines that I'm really excited about. I'll bet. Robert, this has been a really fruitful conversation and I really appreciate it. 
how would you uh, direct our listeners uh, who want to learn more about, about you and Botana? Uh, you can download the iOS app for free right now on the iOS app store. Just search for Botana. Uh, you can also get a little bit more information at botana.io. And uh, I've got a new blog up there as well. Um, if you've ever written a blog, you know how difficult it is to keep those things going. But there's some a little bit of content we just yes, launched. I it. Do. There's going to be more good content coming up. So um, amidst the schedule, you know, trying to keep that updated. But there's definitely um, uh, some good stuff there. And you know, we really want to create a uh, conversation with growers. Uh, I think this is the one thing that that our particular niche of the industry has lacked. Uh, growers tend to be more isolated and, and working on their own. And uh, my goal, you know, over the next couple of years, is to really help build this community of conversation of how do we grow not just as individuals better, but how do we grow as a community as well. Fascinating stuff. Robert, thanks again. I really appreciate it. We'll be watching you guys in the future, and I hope you have a fabulous Friday. Rob, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Had a good time. That's it, everyone. See you next time.